Thank you for coming to TSA Forum uh, visiting AA Visiting School Lecture Series. Uh, today is the third um, lecture that uh, we're doing with AA Visiting School from last year. We had OMMX and uh, Dow Jones last year. Today, um, Anton is Papa Michael, uh, my former student from uh, his time at the AA. Um, is going to talk about, well, talk with the title of Jack of All Trades, Master of None. Um, Antonis is an illustrator and an AA graduate. He's a co-founder of Studio Abroad, um, and he manages his um, website, perpetualoutput.com, where he investigates the relevance of different facets of architecture as disciplines in their own right, leading to essays, comic books, casts, and video games. Um, he was in my unit at the AA making um, some amazingly imaginative projects about um, mainly, usually, relationship between... Uh, uh, sorry, his thesis project was the relationship between two neighbours that lived at the top and bottom floors of Alison and Peter Smithson's house in South Kensington. Um, and it was a project describing a negotiation and the battles between the two neighbours expressed through the materials, construction techniques and time. And he had pursued the same topic, I think, throughout his uh, AA career. Um, and, um, you know, he's, he's very much interested in this tension between the t two opposing um, sides. And uh, since leaving the AA, um, He's worked at some um, very good practices in London at Hayhurst and Co. and David Chipperfield's office for two years. But he decided to pursue a more dynamic way of designing, being more involved with other um, disciplines. And his brave step into leaving the practices and beginning the investigation of several disciplines is um, something that I admire very much. Um, at the AA, we, we often discussed in the unit this notion of craft and how one should find a form of craft that suited um, that particular individual. And I think Antonis has decided to pursue this quite rigorously and, you know, in a very honourable way. And I think this lecture should be hopefully inspiring to those of you who are still studying or working in practices. But, but have some niggling doubts about how the current architectural practice is going or how the procurement and realization of built projects are, uh, are done or made. And um, so our TSA forum workshop um, is run by our office TSA. And um, our aim is to bridge the gap between academia and practice. And hence someone like um, Antonis, you know, is um, is a great example for us to to give this a, a talk. Um, and this year at uh, our forum, um, we're working on proposals um, on uh, English um, parklands and landscape um, surrounding uh, Palladium Manor Hall. And uh, this is a project that we're doing in the office as well, as well as the um, TSA forum students sort of working hopefully slightly more freely outside of that context, but there is an overlap between practice and, um, uh, and, and theory. And we're sort of therefore asking our students to study Palladio's language and how that language transferred to England, especially through Inigo Jones and uh, William Kent, Lord Burlington, James Payne, the travelers. And we've def therefore asked Antonis, I'm not sure if this was a fair request or not, but we've asked Antonis to see his work through the eyes of Inigo Jones, for example. Um, his, I think his diploma unit and projects actually covered a lot of these topics. So um, we've asked him, you know, we've asked him to weave this topic into his talk this evening. So as well as talking about his own work, we're asking him the idea of the language, the role of an architect, etc. So I hope you enjoy it. Hello. Um, 
As Ty kind of mentioned, I'm also, well, I'm still really interested in this kind of the architecture practice and the gap between kind of uh, studying it and practicing it. And also in terms of architecture, this kind of tension between neighbors, I guess. So I studied architecture and I practiced it. And I kind of found that still these are kind of two completely different worlds. And that's what kind of led me to end up freelancing and running my website, um, which kind of focuses on different aspects of architecture as disciplines in their own right. And for me, this is kind of the way to bridge the gap between architecture as a discipline and architecture as a business. Um, and hopefully by elaborating through my work, this kind of will become a bit clearer. And I want to start from kind of more my study work, kind of student work. Um, the first one is kind of about my native country, Cyprus. Um, I find that interesting that when you talk about Cyprus, you always mention the buffer zone, especially if you're an architect. Uh, but I find it more interesting when you focus on how the buffer zone actually influences the cities themselves. So I focused on Nicosia, which is kind of an island within an island. Um, it's kind of the capital. It's a, it has a walled historical city, which was heavily influenced by the church uh, in terms of its formation. Um, and the church actually still kind of manages schools and monasteries that were once isolated um, outside the city. But after the invasion, uh, because Nicosia had to house a lot of refugees, within 15 years it expanded beyond the walls that much, which is a very quick kind of expansion. So these monasteries found themselves scattered over a kind of uh, sprawling carpet of unplanned tissue that was kind of formed mostly by this kind of generic type of housing, which actually is not just housing, it kind of houses apartments, clinics, kindergartens, anything within this uh, generic frame. So all of a sudden you have to kind of reappropriate the church uh, in its kind of new context. Um, so I propose an archetype that exploits the presence of the church and reintroduces the idea of a public space by kind of uh, inserting an open square around it. Uh, the edge is kind of demarcated by this gallery, which allows a lot of different buildings to attach to it, um, which they themselves kind of follow the rhythm of the gallery, uh, which is a modular structure made of blade columns, um, just to offer a kind of directionality. And as you see in the other example of the kind of, um, in the old city, uh, the project really aims to kind of modify the tissue uh, of the city by kind of using the hidden potential of the church as a gathering space. Um, and this kind of inserts places of exception in a kind of formless fabric. And as you can see from the, there's kind of one entrance on the side there at the top, which is basically an alley, but as you go down, the kind of blade columns open up and you see this kind of exception in the city, this kind of open space. So the paving becomes really important as a way to kind of appreciate the church through movement. Um, and it suggests these kind of relationships between the, the kind of more repeatable columns versus the kind of more specific type of church. Um, the next project, which is the last kind of serious project I'll probably talk about, <laughs> Um, is, um, is a type of housing that kind of allows uh, familiar relationships to be relearned. So I started looking at when housing as we know it today was kind of created and I went back to Henry Roberts, uh, which is to me is kind of the kind of model we still live in today. It's kind of parents, pa parents room, children's room, distribution hall, um, and a party wall between the neighbors. So kind of the envelope might change, but the organizational logic is pretty much the same. Uh, and I think this is heavily based on a type of condensed kind of bourgeois apartment where privacy must be important. But when you're kind of this condensed, I think privacy is no longer a choice, it's more of a compulsion. So what I propose is to focus on the distribution hall and the party wall, which to me are the two ways to promote this kind of separation between the family or the neighbors and make them in such a way that they actually promote interaction. So I propose that the distribution hall becomes the only space with the, with the rooms kind of attached to it no longer functioning as rooms, but more just like spaces that, um, that support the main room in the middle, which is what makes the family kind of interact on how to use the common space in the best way. 
uh, in terms of the neighbor scale, uh, the thick wall is kind of shared between two families. So they kind of have to interact on how to maximize its use. So it's no longer a clear line, but it's actually a kind of jagged line which kind of promotes interaction among the neighbors again. Whether it's for a positive or a negative outcome, at least it's interaction. So I propose a 15 by 3 meter frame, which can be inhabited by different types of furniture um, that the people can kind of choose how to inhabit it. And this allows flexibility within the family as the family grows, and also how the relationship with the neighbors can change. For example, if one family wants to use just the space framed by the two walls, then the family next to them can use the whole depth of the wall. Basically, the point is that the wall, the way the wall works is that if you split it in half, it's the least efficient way of using it. So really, this project was kind of about challenging this idea of the, of the room, uh, because we didn't always have bedrooms and, and living rooms. We just had night rooms and, and day rooms, and the furniture could just move around. Um, because I, think, I just think there's more interesting ways of living that don't have to conform with the way the ideal family is presented and the way we try to emulate it. So these are kind of the projects that I went into a normal office in. And um, after working on a project from beginning to end with the concept in mind, all of a sudden you're asked to kind of work, uh, just focus on the detail just without really thinking of the whole picture or just being involved, just being involved in one aspect. So you kind of feel like you're in a factory like Charlie Chaplin in modern times, just doing the same move again and again. And then you go home and it's hard to get out of that frame of mind. And I think it's, a, it's an issue of scale as well, because if the project is too big, then it's really hard to avoid this kind of business-like efficiency in architecture. So while working in an office, I kind of had to get my architectural fix somewhere else. So I started working on the side with some friends on a gallery. Um, and the design was pretty straightforward. Uh, it was basically an office space that we converted into a gallery. So all we did was um, strip up the, the ceiling to gain one meter space, uh, put a nice floor and make the walls white. Uh, so exposing the structure was kind of the only design element. So it was this kind of messy structure at the top. And then as soon as that zone ends, you have the clean walls. And the only place where that kind of is, that concept is questioned is through the, the main uh, column, which is existing. And we decided to celebrate that through the, through the floor by adding that strip. And this is the gallery in uh, action. So once the gallery is done, you get back to just office work and you kind of have a lot of free time to think about the state of architecture, I guess, as a profession and how we contribute to it and whether we try and challenge it or not. So I, had once, had, I once had a debate on kind of whether architecture is a necessity or a luxury. And while others were saying we're a luxury, I was still in the opinion that it's, it's still necessary and it actually requires a similar amount of nuanced knowledge, let's say, as, as people who study medicine or law. Uh, because I think we have the ability to be a really relevant profession when it comes to the development of human beings. You know, houses where a poet is raised or where a thief is raised. And these are the kind of things, these kind of intangible qualities that we've studied. But I don't think we generally practice them. We kind of sell ourselves short in the kind of name of efficiency, areas, amount of rooms, kind of pleasing these kind of developers. And I find it strange that we kind of spend minimum five years of study to just kind of then just use knowledge that we can acquire in like 12 week boot camp or something. Um, so my question is, how do we become relevant again? Because I think we're slowly marginalizing ourselves. Um, which is probably not a good idea. Um, so how can we align our appreciation of architecture with that of the public? I think what we need to do is kind of develop a language that focuses on architecture as a discipline rather than a business. And I think, I think that's the start, and I think we can learn a bit from Inigo Jones, not necessarily from just the architecture, but just in a, his approach to architecture. Um, I mean, he was clearly influenced by Palladio by Italian classicism, 
but he didn't just copy it, he brought it to England uh, and he kind of developed it in his own language just because of the, you know, weather conditions are already different, so things will change. He's famous for Queen's House or Covent Garden. Um, one of his most famous ones is obviously Banqueting House, uh, I think. Well, it's interesting that they're all classical, but they do have the kind of British, uh, they're distinctly British as well. But what I want to focus more about him is the fact that he wasn't just doing architecture, but he was also doing work on masks, which was is basically doing uh, set design um, as well as uh, costumes. So we basically have one of the kind of most respected architects who has developed his own language by adapting an existing one and kind of learning from it. And is also delved into other disciplines uh, while practicing architecture. Um, and he wasn't just involved in every aspect of architecture, but he was good enough to kind of pursue those aspects in their own merit, just as disciplines in their own. And I think that's something we're all aware as architects, so we kind of, architecture is multidisciplinary. When we design, we always go through different disciplines, but we never kind of seek them too far. We just, we just work with them until we challenge a concept or we kind of break a boundary or something. Um, and this is why I kind of left my job and the company I co-founded, which is basically to pursue um, the aspects of architecture as disciplines in themselves. And I'm not interested in how, which is usually the case, how architecture can kind of uh, affect painting or, or sculpting, but the other way around, how these disciplines can actually change our architectural language. So of course, the next logical step is uh, frogs, <laughs> um, specifically the baseball playing kind, which is very, very small amount of frogs. Um, so to explain, my website, as I said, focuses on drawing, making, and thinking. The thinking has kind of already been covered. Um, but the drawing part is kind of the most frequent, and it involves illustrations and comic books. And there are two main ones that I'm working on. One is a quite elaborate epic saga on a community of frogs that is so good at baseball that the game remains 0-0. Zero, zero. So after so many years of playing, um, the game, the baseball becomes part of their culture. So these generations of frogs are trained and born for the single purpose to score and end the game. These are just a few, I mean, it's quite a more elaborate story about a ragtag team of different types of species of frogs whose uh, abilities are quite factually related to their actual, to the frog's actual abilities. I spent about three months of research on different types of frogs. Um, and these are just some spreads from the, from the first issue. I don't want to spoil the ending, but... Uh, <laughs> um, and since you asked, the, the characters have all been developed, uh, yeah, very slowly in these three months. Uh, and this just kind of gives you some hints on their specific abilities and how they relate to baseball, which is quite a clear connection, I think. Um, the next one is basically The Adventures of Mr. Almost, which is kind of a weekly uh, project. And it's kind of slightly more personal. It's about a self-centered introvert and his adventures. And I'm always trying to keep a surreal twist. And the trick for that is to never use thought bubbles. Uh, because I think that kind of helps banal or sad stories kind of to become surreal or funny. Um, again, these are just some spreads. And the other one that's kind of complete is a story about testicular cancer, but from the point of view of the testicles. Um, and this has been published in a few charities just to make people feel, well, make them laugh, I guess. Um, so while working with ink and color is kind of, is great and it kind of helps us appreciate page composition or this idea of limited palette. Uh, what I really enjoy most about comic books is the way we do storytelling. Um, because if you see, for example, this image, it's just a man proposing. And you see another image about probably a, a shop having a sale that's gonna be over soon. But then you combine the two and so all of a sudden you have a different different option. You have so, so suddenly the man is no longer 
as romantic as you think. Um, so it's this thing about having a story and obviously you will sell it and tell it in a linear way. But the way we create it is not, not always linear. You might know the ending, uh, which gives you maybe an idea for the beginning and then you start connecting them to make the middle. And then the story already starts suggesting what it needs to be. So you might want to focus on, let's say, the awkward moments. So then you start adding more and more um, just to create the story so that it makes sense. It kind of forces you to create a story that makes sense, I think. And I'm just thinking, how can we apply this kind of approach to architecture? Can we create a way where we're brilliant enough to kind of remove parts so that the overall makes sense? So we're less attached to our own ideas in a way. Uh, which brings me to video games uh, and the next part of the website, which is making. Um, with video games, I don't think you can be more compact or minimal than when you design video games because you just have a really core mechanic that everything needs to work towards that. It needs to augment it. So one of the video games I'm working on is called Cat Monkey Dungeon. These are all the, um, the sprites for it. And it's basically about, as the name suggests, it's about a architect trying to escape the architectural office slash the, the architectural software. So it's, it has this kind of cat inspired uh, environment. <laughs> and the idea is that, um, yeah, you get kind of cat inspired power ups like cloning, copying, pasting, using lines to trap your enemies and things like that. Uh, so it could be educational, I guess. Um, but th what I like about this is that it's, it's a type of game called roguelike, where basically every time you die, the, the, the stage uh, recreates itself in a different way. So all you have to rely on, you can't rely on memory to learn the stage. You just have to rely on your own ability to learn the mechanics of the game. Uh, and that's the only way to progress. So that's kind of just another interesting thing of being really comfortable with the language, I guess. Um, another game is another one I'm working on, which is basically pure navigation and exploration. Because um, I think in real life, we have this thing of now relying so much on the little dotted line that tells us exactly where to go. Um, and I'm just trying to reintroduce the ability to get lost again and kind of the enjoyment of that. So these are just kind of the environment uh, from the game. Uh, so it's about navigating a foreign world and you kind of making your own notes on it. And, and basically you can share them or not, it's up to you. And kind of my love for video games and the physical world led me to collaborate with Dari Walla, which is a Dari making company and made this kind of 8-bit inspired uh, diary. So it's just a lot of like constant output. In terms of making and the physical world, obviously one must cast. So I started casting useless objects just to test the uh, colors and finish. And as I became more comfortable with it, I started selling slightly more useful objects, but still experimenting. So this is uh, an ashtray. Well, it's basically based on a brick, but it has, a, it has a, um, a handle for your index finger and your thumb. And a slightly more personal project was this lamp, because I have a cast iron bedside table, and my old lamp was just taking too much space on, its, on the surface. So I thought if I magnetize the lamp, then it can be on the side and you can use it much more efficiently. Um, another one was this tiny little solitaire where I just started experimenting a bit with the finish on kind of terrazzo like stuff. And I mean, this is more of a sculpture, but you can call it a paperweight. Uh, it's just a, it's based on Absalon's work, which is a type, type of inhabitations where a little cylinder is actually a bed in real life. And I'm still trying to nail the perfect uh, pink terrazzo, but that's taking time. Um, so as I work on these different disciplines, um, obviously architecture comes knocking because all you know is architects. Um, so if the project is interesting, um, I will work on it. And one of them is this project that will go on, on site pretty soon. It's a commission for a private house. And basically because of weather conditions, they want the boundary of the house to be a wall. 
And after just asking them how they use the space, uh, me and a friend who I tend to collaborate often with, um, we developed this wall of basically three pods, one for plants, one for showering, and one for having breakfast. And the idea here is just to, to basically juxtapose a bunch of elements that have different weight, color, size, proportion. Uh, but it's basically what we like about it is this idea that they're all individual, but somehow they create this mess that we like. Um, and with the same group, we worked on a competition for Cyprus again, which is basically um, an art college in a village. But we didn't want to create an institutional space. Uh, we thought it would be much more interesting to, um, to create a series of houses that basically blend in with the village, because that's what makes that art college special, is the idea that the artists can actually get inspired by village life by actually living it rather than just observing it. Uh, this is where they would live. There's three different types of accommodation. And this is where they would work. Um, this is for ceramics or painting. Um, and although we didn't win, I was quite proud of this because it was an entry where the people working on it knew exactly their strengths and limitations and they worked it together to kind of create something that neither of us would actually create on our own. And the last thing I want to speak about, talk about, is Tiny School, which I came across it on a passive low energy architecture uh, conference. So I don't know how I ended up there, but I was the only person who knew nothing about environmental design. So this one kind of stood out because I was kind of watching environmentalists pre present to environmentalists and architects present to architects. And I was, I was thinking, why do we do that? And then I looked at a paper that was called Integrated Design Strategies for Renovation Projects with Building Integrated <laughs> Photovoltaics Towards Low Carbon Buildings. And I was thinking, this is so specified and marginalized that it's kind of impenetrable. And it's kind of strange that architecture and environmental is no longer kind of connected and you have to have different terms for it. Surely it should be part of it from the beginning. Um, and this is where kind of tiny school came in because it was basically the argument, well, tiny school is a design and make school by Harshit Kotari. And it's, and it's about teaching people that kind of living in a small house can be a choice rather than a compulsion. So it's this idea that to provide a house with good quality of interior, uh, enough of these houses and a low carbon footprint, you just need to scale down basically. Um, and I find that interesting because it's basically the right scale for an architect to be confronted with a design where they can include all aspects from the beginning rather than bolting in uh, as they go along the structure or the, the sustainability. Uh, but for me, what's also interesting is obviously the psychology of sharing, um, sharing a small space within a family. So just to conclude, uh, I mean, my belief is that as architects, we just need to ask ourselves, are we practicing architecture the way we want to or the way we're prescribed to? And I think the key here is to just reestablish a language where we're respected and relevant again. And for me to do that is to follow these disciplines in their own merit so that we stop kind of trying to be a master of one trade. I think the trick is to kind of to be the jack of all trades, you just need to be okay. You just need to be okay with the idea that you're not gonna be a master of any of them. Thank you. Thank you, Antonis, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, we're going to ask if you have any questions uh, in a moment. Um, well. I'm going to start off, but it, if I, I think that was uh, very, very <laughs> stimulating. Um, it random. I'm yeah. I, I it's quite interesting what you're saying about um, the master of none. But you're clearly a master in terms of the the craft of the frogs and the 
you know, the <laughs> way you're drawing, the way you're making, casting. I mean, each of those things, sure. Well, I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't call it a master. It's more just constantly practicing on it. You can always get better, I think. And also, um, I think maybe you can become a master on, let's say, making comic books or something. But when you go back to architecture, you won't be a master on drawing. I think it's still going to be just an aspect. You won't be the main kind of discipline. So it might be, I mean, I, I don't consider it a master. <laughs> so do you think actually in order to become, well, not just architects, but in order for us to become more relevant, trying to become these sort of masters is a sort of an old cliche that is not actually, that, that, that is, I think that's what you're saying is that, the, yeah. the, you know, that, that, Aspiration to be a master in something is already slightly out of touch with yeah. the, the contemporaries. Exactly. I think being a master now is, I mean, there's no point to it. I think, I think generally as architects, we have, I don't know why exactly, but a lot of us have a big ego. <laughs> and I don't know if that's the case on why we feel like we need to be a master in something. So we, even I think when we make furniture or something like that. I think the idea that the piece of furniture we're, we're doing might not be the most comfortable or the best makes us so uncomfortable that we can only make, I'm just using furniture as an example, but we can only make it in a concept where we're somehow breaking the boundary or challenging something that's so important for actual furniture making in a way. It's like, we're just not comfortable with the idea that we might not be the best, I think. So we try and create a context where we become the best. <laughs> and I think that's a tricky, uh, it's just a very difficult environment, I think. Yeah, so in your experience of working in various practices, do you, do you feel that architects are just a bit too serious? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and, and, and on that point, what, what, what do you think of the um, importance of humor in architecture or, or not just architecture, but in design discipline? Well, I think the importance of humor, I would call it more like the importance of not being serious in the sense that from working on video games, I experienced it mu a much easier environment for people's ideas to, to kind of connect and combine and actually think about what's best for the project rather than just putting someone else's idea down to push your idea up. There's no, no such thing as kind of internal politics as much. It's just, it's just actually about what's best for the project. And I think it's an attitude thing which starts with being less serious and less serious about yourself, I think. Just you need to be okay with the fact that you're you might be good at drawing, but you might be really bad at something else. And that's where someone else in the team for that. So I think it's just, it's just an attitude of being more relaxed, I think. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, I would call Palladio not serious, but say Palladio or yeah. Jones. I mean, it's true in the sense that they, they work across a lot of disciplines or uh, uh, in Palladio's case, a lot of different types of clients, uh, mm -hmm. different sides of polit polit politics. Um, and for that, you, you, one n needs to kind of set up yourself as being a lot looser than, yeah. than uh, you know, yeah. I don't know if these people were ever trying to be masters in the first place. Um, yeah. And I think that's because also at that time, you didn't, the architect would do everything anyway. And that kind of, allowed them to be looser and also, you know, they were developing their own kind of language at the same time. Yeah. Um, Jones was a surveyor. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to pass on to maybe somebody else for questioning <laughs> soon, but um, I, I, I just wanted to tell a little story that when um, we went on our unit trip <laughs> um, to Japan, we got, um, all of our flights were canceled because of the snow. 
and uh, Antonis. Uh, Antonis his flight was via Paris, and he was the only student that could could fly that day. And we were in touch with him throughout the whole adventure, and he was playing games in Paris airport for 20 hours or something. A day. And we were having crits in Tokyo, I think, <laughs> on, the, on the day that we arrived there, and I was wondering, what, you know, what, what, what the hell is Antonis doing now, and what is he playing, and actually all those things have become very useful. <laughs> I see that um, <laughs> it's actually become very effective. Yeah, I anyway. almost lost my flight again. <laughs> because I was playing a video game at the time. <laughs> I will, um, I will, yeah. Thanks. So, my, my question is, um, don't you think that by building, you know, several skills uh, that please you and then in some, some sense also please other people, um, mm -hmm. don't you think you essentially become a master of combining those uh, different skills? I think, um, possibly, in a sense, I think studying architecture here, uh, you kind of learn how to not necessarily design a building or anything, but you learn how to design a package in a way, which kind of already starts involving this idea of combining different disciplines or trades, let's say. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, being a master of, being a master of none <laughs> is probably what you're saying, no? Like, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, if you combine them, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think you can ever be a master, but combining them in an efficient way or in a good way that pleases other people is a good start, but I think there's always... I just think you need to be okay with the idea that there's always room for improvement. <laughs> hey, thanks for that. Um, there was a, a... I've got I've got a question, but I sort of need a bit of a preface beforehand. Um, there was a, a lecture in the spring, I think, between uh, Wolfgang Tillmans and Rem Koolhaas. And uh, Wolfgang had this amazing ability to be completely naive about every single aspect of architecture um, and, and just ask all these questions, which is really fascinating. Um, but one of the questions that he asked was, uh, why is it in all of these architectural representations, all of the, the buildings always seem completely inevitable and completely perfect and, and nothing is ever wrong in them? And um, Rem's response was that these were competition images, that these were um, basically fighting for uh, the inevitability of something um, because you want to make sure that there's absolutely no chance that you could ever fail to achieve this building, um, which, which sort of brings me to the idea of, of cost or of scale of architecture. Mm. And um, I think you know, there's a big difference between art and architecture both in, in how you perceive it, but also in just how goddamn expensive it is. Um, that, and that you do need all of these other people to be involved and to trust you. Yeah. And so I, I wonder where this, um, you know, if, if we're not a master, if we're not a, an authority, um, how we can still maintain some sort of um, presence or trust in a world where we have to convince people to give us their millions of dollars, or do we, um, do we move towards smaller scales, more community-based work, more um, crowdsourcing almost, or some other form of convincing in order to make architecture? Well, I think first it would be ideal if you would only do small scale, but that's a personal thing, I guess. I think to get people to trust you is not necessarily being a master on something, but it's also about being more relatable. And I think being more relatable, it's kind of, Again, this idea of hey, being a bit more humble, not having this idea that you're the creative master or you have this big ego. And it's just about, I mean, obviously you, you do need to get their trust with, to get the money, I guess. But, <laughs> but I think, I don't think it's being the master that makes them trust you. It's more being, being having the right attitude to, to be, let's say, more accept uh, accept more on their own suggestions 
but not in the way we do it now, in a way. It's a bit of a tricky one because I think you just need to um, be the kind of architect that somehow is respected from something that is really hard to put down on paper, this kind of intangible thing. It's not about the area or the, or the efficiency of the space or necessarily the atmosphere, but it's just about somehow showing, <laughs> which I don't exactly know how, but I don't think the, I don't think being the master of all these things is the key, it's just to showing, showing how you can manipulate all these different aspects in a unique way. And maybe the ability to admit that you might not be right all the time yeah. could engender some sort of yeah. trust. Exactly. I think. Um, I guess what was really interesting it was to see the variety of projects you've worked on, but I was wondering um, how working on so many different things <laughs> helps like maybe spur on your creativity for different projects. Um, there was a lecture here a few years ago by a brain scientist at UCL about um, where creativity comes from, and he was saying that it's only when you have downtime from thinking about a project that you actually get inspired yep. um, to work on it, which is why like your best ideas happen in the shower <laughs> or when you're going for a run. And so maybe there is something to the, like the aspect of a multifaceted pra practice yeah. that um, when you're working on a video game, you get an idea for your frog baseball yeah. comic or a building or a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you could talk about ways in which these different disciplines overlap. Yeah, um, I mean, it's basically definitely the case. This is something that's happening anyway to us, especially studying architecture. We can never really switch off. You go to a party and, you know, an idea comes. And I think it's the same with doing different different disciplines at the same time. It's just slightly more productive, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely an overlap. For example, not always just through, sometimes it's a very kind of superficial overlap. It might be you're drawing, you're drawing the environment for your frog baseball comic and all of a sudden you draw a structure that looks kind of cool and then you're like, okay, this could be a really nice uh, sculpture on the right scale or this could be a building on a different scale sometimes it's a bit more complex and it's more about the methodology or the approach for example this thing that I was showing with the comic books on how two different languages can create a third one and I think that has place in architecture as well and in you know also in the casting you kind of you do you might be working on an object, but at the same time, you're basically working on the finish or the material or the color for a building. I mean, it's kind of what we were doing in our unit at the time. You, it's kind of this. It's a scale model, but materially, it's a one-to-one -one kind of representation. So this thing of kind of connecting all of them in a lateral way, I guess. Um, I had one more question, which was about audience. Um, mm -hmm. Because especially when you showed that really complex jargon-filled quote about like <laughs> I don't know, photovoltaic panels and stuff, yeah. and when you look at that, you think like, who's the audience for that yeah. terrible sentence? But then I, I was wondering whether like a lot of these projects, did they start as self-initiated projects, and did you already have in mind who, like, an audience they were for, or has that come along the way? Um, um, some of them have an audience in mind. Either it's a client or just people are like reading comic books or something like that. Other times I just I just have the need to just produce, especially when I was working in an office where I wasn't doing much. I had to be home and do something and that kind of slowly generates um, something that you can actually build on. I mean, for example, the frogs just started me one day thinking frogs are cool after work. And then you slowly start drawing them, um, and it slowly becomes something. Um, so I think, in terms of audience, the tricky thing is present finding the penetrating the audience you're working for. Because sometimes it's not like they will always ask you to do this. You do it first, and then you find a publisher or find something that will work for you. I've got a question about 
how you manage your time and your own practice of work. So you see your kind of your drawings and your comics. Would would you kind of do that in a, you know, uh, in in your in your own time outside of practicing architecture, or is that done kind of just completely in isolation? If that makes sense. No, I mean it's it started while working in an office, then quit the office, have a bit more time. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's in a structured way. For example, the drawings, where you say, you know, four pages a day. Um, but no more structure than that. It's not necessarily saying, I'm going to work nine to five. Yeah. It's just, you manage your own time a lot more uh, and in a better way. But it's, I don't think it's ever in isolation because some of it, you know, some of it is never ending. And then you get a, another client and you won't say you're just one or two people, you're not going to say no. Yeah. And then tell them you have to wait till this finishes. It's constant, like managing your time, putting three different, you might work on three different disciplines in a day if you have to, you know, a bit of architecture, then sculpting. Then so in a typical day, you, you could do, you would do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's a, it's a nice kind of, and what Manija was saying earlier, it's a nice break from one to the other. Cause you know, if you do CAD software all the time, you get tired. But if you would sp split it between CAD software and models, it's a bit better. So it's a bit like that, but not models and CAD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool, thanks. Hey, um, just a quick question. I was wondering, because you're, you're kind of outside of the classical architectural practice now, um, where do you see uh, where the future of architectural education is heading? And um, maybe another thing also related to that, um, it's kind of, you've been talking a lot about playing and kind of letting things happening. So and I think um, the notion of play within your work is quite interesting because it's, it's not random. So it, 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 it kind of plays with a, a specific pattern or rule set. So there's probably a reason why you don't cast, for example, frogs or things <laughs> like that. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, unfold a bit um, what you think could, should uh, architectural education kind of more push in that direction and, um, yeah. Um, well, okay, I think my opinion on architectural education, as I said earlier, is this thing that there's a gap between that and practicing. Um, this is a bit of a preface, but it's basically um, there's so many different versions of architecture in education. You have the unit system where basically every master thinks architecture is something else. Um, but I think um, play is important because it allows you, again, to kind of be okay with that. And also I think, I don't think education should necessarily teach you what you do in an office, which is more, um, more, you know, detailing or the more business side. I think it's much more interesting to kind of put you in a frame of mind where the work you do is something worth investing in. And I think having this kind of relaxed approach with play is important because it allows you to kind of, you know, come up with more ideas and accept different ideas. And at the same time, um, what was, what was the last thing you said about the... <laughs> oh, it was, um, I think you, you answered the question quite well. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I forgot. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, so another question is, let's say you're advising someone who's, you know, soon to, soon to be a, a, an actual architect. So let's say graduating this year. Yeah. What would your advice be to, to that person to go into like a non-traditional architecture job or like life that, uh, you know, and, and doing that with confidence. So confidence of knowing that it is somehow the, the right path, even though it's not what other people are doing. Uh, assuming that person came from a university where um, the education you get is not the one that's similar to architectural practice. 
the one that's like here, which is about unit systems and architecture as a concept or as a discipline rather than a than you know knowing how to draw the AC unit or you know this kind of uh, the more practice related things, I would tell them to work on their own <laughs> and try that first before they go to an office. Um, and if it doesn't work, you're always equipped enough to go to a more traditional office. I think the, the question was more about work on their own on what? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to tell them what they, what they should work on. They should probably know already uh, whether it's architecture or not. Um, if it's not architecture, I mean, just... It's up to, I mean, it's hard to, to tell them what they should work on if, if their passion is not architecture, I think. <laughs> I, th I think that if there are no more questions, um... Thanks, Anthony. So I, I think that question about the master thing is still very, very interesting, and mm -hmm. that's something that I, I would actually think about a, a lot longer <laughs> than than this evening. But it's sort of, as far as if if I understand it correctly, I think what you were saying halfway through the lecture was that, I, I actually I don't think you were saying that um, architects are. Uh, you know, not capable to be trusted with money or uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, funding. I think you were describing it as if you're okay <laughs> at yeah. what you do, uh, uh, there needs to be this sort of sense of, you know, um, cross discipline. As architects, you need to you need to know a lot more than just sort of what you're doing on your drawing drawing board yeah. or, or on a, on a on a on a, uh, on a computer drawing. Um, but I think this idea that, you know, even I think OMA, you know, the question was really interesting, but I think OMA actually were the, you know, I remember being a student thinking, gosh, is that okay? You know, like they were the masters of actually moving away from the serious uh, uh, 20th century icons of architects. And I think what you're saying is actually sort of step, step beyond even. I think now we've got these sort of very, bureaucratic procurement routes and um, uh, mundane process. And I don't actually believe that these architects are particularly masters, mm. you know, in achieving these kind of projects and multi-billion pound kind of developments. And, and I think, yes, I think they sort of step back and just be a bit more, a um, yeah. bit more of a, uh, a, a non-architect, if you, if, if you like, uh, uh, would actually help the profession to be a yeah. little bit more kind of so. with a bit more common sense and um, and play and sense of humor, as, as you were really kind of mm -hmm. saying. Um, so very stimulating. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, um, next week, actually, uh, we have um, uh, Charles Holland, uh, coming to talk about a similar topic um, and his work and his inspiration from history. Um, that's on the 21st on Thursday, the same venue. So please do come along. But thanks so much, Antonis, for that. Thank you. Thank you.